Stand, please. behalf of the family, we'd like to just thank you uh, for being here on this Saturday morning. And we're going to begin with prayer. We're going to have a couple of songs that we're going to invite you to, uh, to sing with us as Brother Victor Howard leads us in a moment. Uh, Brother David Ellis will be reading the obituary. But for right now, let's just pray together. Our Father in heaven, uh, we know with every step we take in this life that we need you and that we have you. But there are those times, Father, when we're asking for a, a special, special measure of your presence and your love and your peace and your comfort, your strength. And this is one of those times that we're praying about and praying for. So we ask first your blessings on the family as they remember Brother Robert and we're asking Father your blessings on and thanksgiving for those who have taken time to attend this this service that remembers him but honors you and Father may may it just be a piece of what you bring to this family in this time that they'll experience your comfort and your blessings that we all have because of your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. Number 545, if you want to follow along in our songbooks, number 545. If you have it, let us sing. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and covers me there with his hand. With his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holds me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. Oh, and clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. 
He is perfect salvation, His wonderful love. I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows the dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand and covers me there with his hand. Amen. Robert Drury Veal, 82 years old, of Ranger, Texas, drew his last breath on earth and bit, went to be with his Savior on June 5th, 2023, in Sherman, Texas. Robert was born in Ranger, Texas, to Carl Garland Veal and Eva Ruth Veal on October the 8th, 1940. He attended school at Ranger High School in Ranger, Texas. Robert married his wife of 54 years, Rita Jolene Eubank, on November 2nd, 1968, in Ranger, Texas. He earned a degree from Ranger Junior College and then spent the majority of his career as an electronics technician for Texas Instruments. Robert was a veteran of the United States Air Force during Vietnam and spent almost two years of that service in Rota, Spain. Robert was preceded in death by his parents, Carl and Ruth Veal, his sister, Beverly Jean Stein, and his baby brother, Carl Garland Veal, Jr. Robert is survived by his beloved wife, Rita Jolene Veal, his sons, Darren Robert Veal and wife Barbara, and Ryan Thomas Veal and wife Heather. He is also survived by eight grandchildren, Kim Mefford, Jessica Escobar, Jacob Veal, Dylan Veal, Peyton Veal, Carson Veal, Austin Veal, and Hunter Veal, as well as seven great-grandchildren, Ronnie Lopez, Hunter Medford, Johnny Medford, Bella Escobar, Connor Medford, Angel Escobar Jr., and McKinley Medford. The entire family wishes to extend their sincere thanks to the doctors, nurses, and staff who cared for him for his final days, and to the many loved family and friends who have surrounded them with love. Our next selection is number 801. If you're following along in our songbooks, 801, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths in God's word he has given. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. In heaven no drooping nor pining. No wishing for elsewhere to be. God's light is forever there shining. How beautiful heaven must be, how beautiful heaven must be, sweet home of the happy and free, fair haven of rest for the weary, how beautiful heaven must be. Here waters of life there are flowing, and all who will drink may be free. Rare jewels of splendor are glowing. 
How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. Well, once again, and in behalf of the family, let me welcome you to this service, remembering the life of Robert Veal. In our busy world that we inhabit at, you could have been doing something else today. You may have already had it on your schedule. For me, it was being with my grandkids, and it's glad to have some relief from that. Perhaps you had a list of activities for today, but you've laid them aside for another time to be here for the family, and I know they say thank you. We're here today for several reasons. Each one of these reasons could be a eulogy in itself. But I'll try to keep it as short as I can. And there will be two family members at the end who will share some thoughts about their relationship and what they remember about Brother Robert. But we are here today to offer comfort and support to you guys, to the family and this church family bringing support to the physical veal family. But in all of that, first we recognize that God is the greatest comforter. And we recognize that for several reasons. One being that he created us from the inside out and from the outside in. He's the one that can touch our hearts in just the right way and at just the right time because he made our hearts. Secondly, God just flat loves us and there's nothing we can do about it. The Jews had a word for this kind of love and it's the Hebrew word kezed. And if you opened your Old Testament, depending on what version you have, you would find it translated in different ways. Perhaps loving kindness, perhaps steadfast love, even perhaps mercy. Because there's not really an English word that carries the thought of that Hebrew word. But in one word, it's being communicated to us that God always has, does now, and always will love us. Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 5, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. Now listen to this next phrase so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. And so Paul is saying that as we have received the comfort of God, and I would say that everyone in this room this, this morning who has given their lives to Jesus Christ has received the comfort of God sometime. And that becomes then an opportunity for you to give that comfort. And family, perhaps in some awkward ways, and perhaps in not knowing just exactly how to do that, we are sharing with you, giving to you, our comfort that we receive 
from God. The psalmist of the Bible will say, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. We might like that to say, or we might rather have it said, that the Lord will keep you from being brokenhearted and keep you from being crushed in spirit. But it doesn't say that. What it does say is that we are going to face times like that. And he tells us that in anticipation of it happening because it's going to. And what he says is I have not forsaken you during those times. Rather, I'm close to you. It's where he wants to be. And that's where you want him. And that's where you want to be. You also need to know that God is with you in a very special way at this time. The psalmist will go on to say in Psalm 116 and verse 15 that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And one saint has gone home to be with God. And when we read this verse and, and it says precious in the sight of the Lord, I would simply remind us that whatever you call precious in your life is something that you hold very close to yourself. And it could be virtually anything. It might be your children. It might be, it might be your favorite rod and reel. It might be your car. It could be your house. But whatever you deem precious, you hold close to you. And that's what God is saying here. These folks that have become saints, my people, they are precious to me. And I hold them close to my heart. It almost, it almost seems to give the message that, and I can't wait for you to come home. Not that he's wishing anybody die in a hurry, but that your relationship with him makes him desire to be with you and therefore has prepared a place for you. He sent Jesus to make that possible. The house is ready. Jesus will say in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it weren't so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I'll take you back to be with me. And that's what God wants. We can't even begin to imagine what God has in store for those of us who leave this life to take on eternal life. Paul will say once again in 1 Corinthians 2, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, nor heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, that passage says, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. This gives us the third reason why God is the greatest comforter. Because into the hearts of those who have been obedient to Jesus Christ and have become his disciples, he has sent to live his Holy Spirit. Jesus stated that he would send another when he leaves his disciples. And so the comfort of the paraclete, the comforter, we have living in us. But you also need to know that we still offer our support to you, the family. You have to know how much we have grown to love you over the short time that you've been a part of the Parkview family. It doesn't seem possible because it seems like you've always been here, Rita. But it was a year ago this past Tuesday 
that the Veal family moved into their house. And I remember that. I remember it wasn't easy. I remember that there were some hiccups along the way. And many in this church family were there to help. One of them sitting right up here behind me. There are several things I want to say about Robert. Some of it is going to be very short because two family members are going to speak after I get through concerning their feelings about Robert in those areas. But I do want to mention, first of all, that he, Robert, was first a very faithful family man, husband and father. Rita told me a little bit about Robert, and one thing she mentioned was all the places that he set up for them to go on vacation when he had time off from TI. And she mentioned places faster than I could write them down. And that's good family time. And he was also a faithful husband. You know, I have heard of various marriages beginning in interesting ways. I know of people meeting online. And then perhaps through finally getting together, eye to eye, they end up getting married. I guess a long time ago in our history, as a nation, there was such a thing as a mail order bride. I hope you weren't one. But apparently a man could send enough money to someone and buy himself a woman and they'd marry. And I suppose live happily ever after. Some couples drive all the way to Vegas so somebody dressed like Elvis can marry them. And they would all say that their marriages were made in heaven. Well, I want to share one with you today, a marriage that was made behind the wheel. Robert and Rita both worked at TI, and Rita didn't have her driver's license. So she would bum a ride with whoever else worked at TI to get to work every day, and I don't remember exactly how this third party got into the picture, but finally Robert asked Rita if he could teach her to drive. I'm thinking that a woman has no choice but to marry a man who taught her to drive. <laughs> so he did. And she got her driver's license. Then there came a time when they needed to meet, meet each other's families. And so he, I was going to say, let her, but I think he made her drive from Lawton, Oklahoma to Port Aransas, Texas, in his words, so she could practice. Well, she had her license. So I don't know if she drove him to marrying her or if it just had to happen. And I think the Lord made all that happen. But I will say this. I know Rita had no thought or idea that one day she would be Robert's chauffeur and would have to drive him around. And she did as part of her ministry to him. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. I will delight in your decrees and forget, not forget your word. Your laws please me. They give me wise advice. Help me understand the meaning of your commandments, and I'll meditate on your wonderful deeds. Make me walk along the paths of your commands, for that is where my happiness is found. 
Give me an eagerness for your laws rather than a love for money. Do not teach your word of truth. Take your word of truth from me, for your regulations are my only hope. Your promise revives me. It comforts me in all my troubles. I stay awake through the night thinking about your promise. I rejoice in your word like one who discovers a great treasure. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you've given me life. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You are my abiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold, more than fine gold. I rise above, before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your word. I rejoice at your word like, like one who finds great spoil. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin. Open my eyes that I might behold the wondrous things of your law. Robert did not say any of these, but he could have. They could be his words. They're the words of the psalmist from Psalm 119, and only some of them. As the psalmist, the psalmist reflected on his life relative to the word of God. Almost as if to say, and I think rightfully so, he couldn't get enough of it. And that's Robert. Couldn't get enough of it. He could have said some of these words. He rose up at 5 o'clock every morning to study his Bible. And he had all kinds of tools available to him, including the tools of the original language. And uh, Darren told me that his dad wanted to learn to read the Greek New Testament, but never got around to doing that. Just so he could understand more about the Word of God. Rita, I remember when you rolled into town, and you rolled in in more ways than one, and you visited with me in my office, not having secured a house and driving back and forth uh, every day. But that first visit in my office was enough to let me know that Robert was a long-time serious student of the Word of God. Every teacher of the Bible in this church wanted Robert to be in their class because they knew he would add some good things to what was being discussed and hopefully one day would be able to teach in one of these classes. But that never happened. I guess I was so excited about meeting you and Robert that I let you drive off one day with my phone in your car. And I chased you down the street. Do you remember this? And fortunately, that light turned red. So I could pull up right behind you and get my phone. If you ask Robert what his favorite book was, guess what he'd say? The Bible. Although early on, he was an avid reader, checking many books out of the library at a time and reading them. If you would ask him what was his favorite book in the Bible... He would say the whole thing. At one point in his life, he asked and agreed to be an elder for, for a church in Plano. And if you're familiar with the, the qualities of a man who would become an elder, the Bible says holding firm to the trustworthy word. The trustworthy word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. But his dedication to the Lord started a long time ago. He grew up in a family where dad didn't go to church. So it was the kids and mom who'd go to church every Sunday. One Sunday, he came and sat down by his dad and said, well, dad, if you don't need to go to church, I don't either. And dad said, you go ahead and get dressed and go to church today, and I'll go with you next Sunday. Don't know how long, well, how long it was, but he was eventually baptized into Jesus Christ. I think we share the gospel in many ways, and one is by example. I want to pause what I'm going to say for the rest of what I'm going to say, 
And I'm going to invite a couple of members of the family who are prepared to share. One of them will stand up here and one I will read. And then I'll have some closing remarks and prayer and we'll be through. But Jackie, you want to come on up and share? This is Jackie, Rita's sister. Rita's baby sister. <laughs> In April 1968, my husband and I were transferred to Germany with U.S. Army. In August of 1968, I received a letter from my sister. Oh, by the way, for those of you who are, you, are used to instant communication through Facebook, FaceTime, cell phones, and other technology, we had none of that only letters. Anyway, back to the letter from my sister. She was asking me if I would come to Texas from Germany to be her matron of honor when she married a man she had met at work named Robert Veal, as Brother Larry has so eloquently told us how that happened. I flew into Love Field, there was no DFW back then, and Robert and Rita picked me up and immediately took me to Houston to see my in-laws. All of this during the busy final days before their wedding. They will never know how appreciative I was for their kindness and thoughtfulness to me. Then on November the 2nd, 1968, Robert Drury Veal and Rita Jolene Eubank made a commitment to one another and began their life journey together. Many of you today may only have known Robert as a man in very, very ill health who rode a scooter. However, we knew him as a very strong man. As a matter of fact, my brother just said uh, last night, I think, he was the strongest man I think I ever knew. <laughs> he was a very, very strong man. And there was virtually nothing he could not fix. For many years, Robert worked 60 hours a week but made certain he was at home on weekends for his family, where he spent many hours coaching his sons, Darren and Ryan, mostly in baseball, but in actuality in any sport that contained a ball. He was very well qualified to do so because he was a football star in high school and earned a scholarship to Abilene Christian College. He also worked with his boys when they were in Boy Scouts, as well as their many, many other activities. When they lived in Howe, he built a two-story fort for Darren and Ryan, one with a pole to slide down and also a trampoline close enough so the boys and their friends could jump off the roof of the fort onto the trampoline. I even got pulled into jumping on that trampoline one time. My, sis, my daughter's laughing her head off. And I jumped with my son, even though Rita was... Uh, even though Rita's rule was one on the trampoline at a time. But I, that did not pertain to me. And so my son and I jumped, and I paid for it with a black eye, and she has never let me forget it. Lesson learned, disobedience always has consequences. Robert also took his family on summer vacations every year, also has been, been mentioned something that Rita and Darren and Ryan always looked forward to and greatly enjoyed. They went to Mesa Verde three times. They took a three-week vacation once to Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. And by the way, all of these vacations were camping trips and not in an RV, if you get my meaning. Tents, cooking on a fire. I just personally can't imagine it, but anyway. A hotel is my idea of a vacation. They never invited me along either. Other vacations included Tennessee, South Carolina, Florida, which included, of course, Disney World and Cape Canaveral, the Smoky Mountains, Maryland, Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania, Mississippi, Oklahoma, and Alabama. They loved outdoor dramas and went to many, many of them. Robert and his family also loved the water and took many trips to Port Aransas with a dune buggy in tow in the early days. Robert owned several boats down through the years, and they loved to go to Bottom Lake. 
My family went with them on one occasion. My daughter's laughing again. Rita and I took the boat out, and I rowed us round and round in circles. I just never got the hang of that rowing a boat business. That row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, that didn't work for me. Anyway, all the rest of the family was on the shoreline laughing their heads off at me. But it was fun in spite of it. I must say, though, that one thing Robert did was choose his wife wisely. He himself said many times that Rita was God's greatest gift to him. She stood by him literally through thick and thin, particularly when ill health began to rear its ugly head. Robert was a diabetic for 44 years and experienced numerous complications throughout the years, complications such as two open-heart surgeries, numerous stents, and too, too many others to enumerate, enumerate here today. The last health battle he fought was gangrene, blood infections, and finally the amputation of both of his legs. In spite of all these issues, the commitment they made to each other stood the test of time for 54 years, seven months, and three days. They vowed for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Today, we have seen the final fulfillment of those vows. Thank you, Jackie. And this is from Ryan. As I sit here late at night, I have written and erased this several times already. For the past several days, I've spent countless hours replaying the time spent with my father. Now, here I sit on the night preceding his burial, and I am overwhelmed. How do I talk about dad's entire life in just a couple of minutes? How do I share all the great things he did in his life? The truth is, I couldn't even begin to scratch the surface of dad's life in just a few moments. There's more than a lifetime of memories to sift through. I could spend days or even weeks talking about the good times we had, the places we visited, and the things we've done. But with the precious couple of minutes I have, I want to share with you the three best attributes of my father. My dad was many things to many people, to many a friend, to others a coworker, to some a mentor, to others a listening ear, son, brother, uncle, nephew, all things he was. But of all things that dad was to different people, there are three that stand out above the others. First and foremost, dad was a man of God. Anyone that knew him knows his faith was unshakable. He truly loved God with all his heart. He did his absolute best to live as blameless a Christian life as he could. He was devoted to scripture and spent time in it daily. He has patterned what devotion to our maker should be like. If it was Sunday or Wednesday, you knew right where dad would be. No better example of a man of God have I ever seen. Secondly, my dad was a devoted husband. He loved mom with all his heart. He was devoted to her and her alone. He has held her hand every church service for longer than I've been alive. And those of you that have gone to church with mom and dad know exactly what I'm talking about. But more importantly, he truly acted out what is written in scripture and truly loved mom like Christ loves the church. No better example of a devoted husband have I ever seen. Lastly, my dad was just that, a dad and a granddad. He truly loved his kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids as hard as he could. My father did his absolute best to raise Darren and I as respectful Christian men. He gave us the foundations on which our own faith, faiths are built on. He was devoted to being a present father with us. From scouts to sports and everything in between, he was always involved with us in our activities. At times, he was our coach, but forever, he was our biggest fan. 
In fact, as I think back through the years as a kid, I cannot remember a single game that he did not attend from the Little League fields in Howe to making the drive out to Abilene to cheer me on in college. He was always right there. No better example of a loving father have I ever seen. I thank God for the legacy that my dad will leave. Though he has gone to be with his Savior, his presence lives on in the example he left us all. I can say I will never look at the Bible without remembering the man of God he was. I will never look at my own wife without remembering what a devoted husband he was. And I will never look at my children without remembering what a loving father he was. I want to end by asking everyone in this room to look around. Some of you know each other, some not. When I look across this room, I see faces that span my dad's entire lifetime. Some have known him for many decades, others for only a year or two. Some are young, others are old. Some drove many hours to get here, some just down the street. There is a true lifetime of relationships that my dad had in this room, and that in itself is a testament to the man that he was and how much he was truly loved. Dad, we will miss you dearly, but your legacy will live on for generations to come. I'm not sure that Robert would be comfortable with everything we said about him today. He wasn't that kind of man. And if he had written his own eulogy, it might be something like this, extremely shorter than what I just delivered, but I think it's who he was. I think he would say something like, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. You see, that's what he wanted for everybody. Interesting that three words from which the word eulogy comes are used in this passage. And all three of them speak to the same thing about praising God for what he's done for us in Christ Jesus. And so Robert would not want me to, to not mention the fact that only those in Christ, only those who've responded to the gospel, only those who recognize that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for you will you experience what God has prepared for those who love him? And then and maybe if, you're, if you are alive before Jesus returns, this might be your eulogy. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Brother Victor is going to lead us in another song, and then we'll have a final prayer. Number 449. 449, if you are following all in our songbooks. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. My one in trial sore. I close to him for blood. Sings and he gives them more and more. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain 
harvest of grain is my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I'll trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life has no end. Eternal pray together. Father, God, creator, lover, giver of peace, giver of comfort, source of strength, source of wisdom, we just come to you today asking you in every way possible, definitely within your being, to bring comfort, peace, strength, love and power to the Veal family today. And Father, help them to even experience your presence today and the love that you have for them. May they even feel your arms wrapped around them as they walk through, not only today, but in the days to come. And Father, may, may our comfort be with them through that journey too, showing that uh, that we have our love for them that's also never-ending. That's because we have the example of you, Father, and your Son, and his sacrifice that you sent him to so that, Father, we could give our lives to you through him and there have the blessings from you for those that are yours. So thank you for all of that. And we pray this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus, and by his authority. Amen.